In today's study, we're going to be focusing upon the subject, Will God Forgive Abortion? It is not uncommon with the number of people who follow our teaching and ministry. There are untold numbers of people who struggle with the emotion and the trauma and the spiritual wrestling of past mistakes. And on this subject of abortion, it's important to understand what the Bible says. And so in our study today, we're going to address this hotly debated subject. And during our time together, I'm going to answer five questions on the subject of abortion. Uh, number one, does the Bible mention abortion? Some have often said Christians really have no platform to stand upon because the Bible doesn't mention the word abortion one single time. Well, is that true? Number two, is abortion always a sin or are there exceptions for some of the complicated issues that surround abortion? Number three, what about cases of rape or incest? I've often been asked that, and again, a difficult question, but we're going to answer it. Number four, can you be a Christian and be pro-choice? Uh, speaking of hotly debated questions, can you be a Christian and be pro-choice? And then lastly, number five, will God forgive me if I have had an abortion? I want to preface my remarks right up front in the infancy of our study uh, to tell you that I have no desire uh, to be neither cold nor condemning on this difficult subject. As I prepared for our study today, I felt in my spirit to be very sensitive in understanding that there will be women who will be listening today who have had abortions and are deeply wrestling with trauma and emotional pain and spiritual uh, complications. And I want to assure you that I have no desire to be harsh with you. I genuinely have prayed to be a help to you. And as I prayed, I, I felt in my heart uh, not to address this per se as a Bible college and seminary president, but rather, I'm going to endeavor to posture my thoughts and my remarks, uh, not as an academic, but as a father. How would I approach? I actually, as I was praying, felt in my heart, if I were sitting down with my own daughter, if I were sitting down with my own granddaughter, how would I approach this difficult subject? So as we begin, let me tell you, as I often do, I love you enough to look you in the eyes and tell you the truth. It is not my privilege, nor is it my purview to take what the Bible says and try to tailor that narrative so that it fits our modern culture. I want to, in the best of my ability, to lovingly tell you exactly what we see in the scriptures. Because in eternity's morning, you're not going to stand before me. You're going to stand before God. And so with love, with compassion, and with a prayerful heart, let's get right into this subject because, uh, as I've said, I don't want to be a part of adding to your hurt. I'm praying that I can be today a part of your healing. And we're going to begin reading in Psalm 139. And if you're taking notes to all of our new students, we ask you to bring three things to the study. Bring a Bible, bring a way of taking notes, and bring a highlighter. And so as we always do, we're going to start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible so that you might have the assurance this is not my view, this is not a denominational bent, this is straight from the pages of the Bible, and we'll break it down for you carefully as we answer these five questions. Psalm 139, beginning to read at verse 13. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. 
Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Can I pause right there and take your highlighter and run it through those words? You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. As we always do, let's take some time uh, to pray together just before we launch into these five questions. Father, once again, uh, as we open up the sacred scriptures and look into the pages of the Bible to discover your will, your word, your counsel, your wisdom, and your advice for life. We humble our hearts in your holy presence, and I pray that by the anointing of the Spirit that you'll do what no study can do, what no lecture can do, what no sermon can do. I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to every ear and to every heart. I pray specifically for all of the women who are listening who perhaps have gone through an abortion and really wonder exactly where they stand with God. Help me to help them. Let the forgiveness and the healing of God be well established in all that we say and do. And for all things, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, my hero in the faith, as you've heard me say many times, Dr. Billy Graham once said, and I quote, I know it is common today to think of abortion as a simple answer to an inconvenient problem, but it is actually a far more serious issue. Your child isn't simply a mass of tissue. He or she is a human being in God's eyes. End of quote. Uh, if you're taking notes, let me repeat the five questions that we're dealing with in our Bible study today. We'll come to them one by one, and you'll have more time to write them down. They'll also uh, be on the screen in this study. But the five questions that I'm going to limit my attention to, number one, does the Bible mention abortion? Number two, is abortion always a sin? Number three, what about cases of rape or incest? Number four, can you be a Christian and be pro-choice? And the last and fifth question we'll deal with today is, will God forgive me if I have had an abortion? And I'm going to ask you to follow from word one till the end of this teaching because of how important it is. And I feel that there are many, as I have prayed and believe, and know that thousands upon thousands listen to our YouTube channel and to our podcast channel and follow us on Facebook and on X. Only God knows how many thousands of people will listen to this study but I want it to be important to you. And even if you're a man listening, as you're going to learn today, the subject of abortion is not exclusive to women. Many men play a direct part in the process of abortion, and the Bible has much to say, and so I'm challenging both our male audience and our female audience to listen carefully. Now, some of you have never had an abortion, but I'm asking you to pay careful attention because I believe there are probably people in your life or in your family 
maybe a daughter, maybe a granddaughter, and you need to understand from the sacred scriptures how do we approach such a difficult subject because silence is not the answer. And in many cases, this is how Christians posture themselves because it is such a complex subject and traumatic subject, many put their head in the sand and that is not what we're going to do today. Number one, does the Bible mention abortion? Now, we do not find the word abortion found in the English translation of the Bible. And as you have heard me teach throughout the years, we must not hold the English Bible above all other languages and all other interpretations. The Bible was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. I hold in my hands an English translation of the Bible, and English is my native tongue, as is for many of our listeners. But just because a particular English word is not in the Bible does not allow us to ignore the subject defined by that word. Because when we study both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find unequivocally the teaching of sanctity of life and that life begins in the womb. As a matter of fact, life begins at conception. And I'm going to reveal that to you today in the scripture. Have you ever stopped to consider that a fetus in the New Testament we read in the Gospel of Luke, that fetus in his mother's womb, Elizabeth, later to be known as John the Baptist, given his name by divine assignment while still in his mother's womb, did you know that a fetus was perhaps the very first life to rejoice at the promised coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, was himself at that time in the womb of Mary, his mother. Think about that. If you're wondering about the sanctity of life and where God places a beginning or a start or an initial foundation upon the existence of life, it was a fetus who was perhaps the very first to rejoice at the announcement of the promised coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, who himself at that time was in the womb of his mother Mary. Uh, if you have your Bible, go to uh, the book of Luke and let me show that to you. Luke and the 14th chapter. Luke chapter 14, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 1, going down to verses 41 through 44. Luke chapter 1, verses 41 through 44. The Bible said, At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Run a highlighter through those two words, your child. Verse 43, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. So run a highlighter in verse 42 through the words, your child, and then run a highlighter in verse 44 through the words, the baby in my womb. Before John the Baptist or Jesus were born, they were called a child and a baby and not a fetus. So here we see biblically that in the purview of God's perfect wisdom and creation, a baby is a baby in the womb. A child is a child while yet in the womb. And let me show you a really interesting passage in the Old Testament. Go all the way back uh, to the book of Exodus. 
and the 21st chapter, Exodus chapter 21, and go down to verse 22 through 25. Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25, and I'm reading today out of the New Living Translation. In Exodus 21 and 22, the Bible says, Now suppose two men are fighting, and in the process they accidentally strike a pregnant woman, so she gives birth prematurely. If no further injury results, the man who struck the woman must pay the amount of compensation the woman's husband demands and the judge approves. But if there is further injury, the punishment must match the injury. A life for a life. Run a highlighter through that. A life for a life. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. A hand for a hand. A foot for a foot. A burn for a burn. A wound for a wound. A bruise for a bruise. So as we study the law of God, we see that if a man through violence causes a pregnant woman to lose her baby, the penalty was death. And the law and its punishment reveal to us that God considers the unborn life of a baby in the womb equal to the life of an adult man. Very important. That Old Testament passage in Exodus shows us that in the law of God and in the eyes of God, a baby in the womb is a life. The Bible said a life for a life. God considered the unborn baby a life as much as the adult man who carried out violence against a pregnant woman. Not a fetus, a life. So we've already seen that in the scriptures, in the womb, the Bible refers to that baby as a baby, a child, a life, and not a fetus. And then go back into the very first book, the book of Genesis, and the 25th chapter. Genesis chapter 25, and go down to verse 21. Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. There the Bible said, Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in the womb. While in the womb, God referred to them, not as a fetus, but as two children. It said before they were born, God called them children. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are multiple passages where I could show you throughout both Old Testament and New Testament that the Bible is unequivocally clear that while in the womb, they're not just flesh, they're not a blob of cells at any point from conception forward because a soul has been implanted, even in the womb, the Bible calls them a life. The Bible calls them a baby. The Bible calls them a child. The twins were called children, and so on. The Bible leaves no wiggle room in proper interpretation of theology a baby is a life before it is born and has the same sanctity of life as any full-grown man or woman. Question number two, is abortion always a sin? I say this in love, but let me be clear. Murder is a sin, according to the scripture, and abortion is a form of of murder. Abortion is a willful, planned choice to end the life of an innocent baby, and therefore abortion is always a heinous sin. Now again, I'm not wanting to condemn anybody. 
I'm not trying to be cold and unfeeling and harsh, but it is wrong for anybody you're listening to, any minister, any preacher, any evangelist who takes the Bible and twists it to soften the narrative, to make you feel better about yourself, is no spiritual friend. They are indeed a spiritual enemy. I love you enough to look you in the eyes, open the Bible, define what the scripture says, and clearly tell you. Abortion is always a sin, but it is not the unpardonable sin, and we'll come back to that. Question number three, what about cases of incest and rape? When it comes to the subject of abortion, what should the believer carry for a view concerning incest and rape? Uh, Christians are oftentimes confronted with this difficult question, especially in the legal and political platforms. What about cases of rape or incest? Well, the first thing that I would want to teach you and I would want you to understand is that abortions that are directly connected to rape and incest are less than 1%. Now, that doesn't mean they don't exist. I'm just telling you that over 99% of the time, the issue of rape or incest does not apply. But neither do we want to ignore the less than 1% who are caught in this incredibly difficult situation. While any compassionate Christian would certainly understand the emotional trauma of a pregnancy uh, that's connected to rape or to incest, you must also intelligently ask yourself the question, is the subsequent murder of that innocent baby a solution? And I would say it is not a solution, let alone a biblical answer. We sometimes overlook that the trauma of killing the unborn baby, and this is provable through psychiatry and, and medical reports and, and, and so on, a woman who aborts her baby because of rape or incest, there is much data that shows that her trauma and her pain and her problems from aborting the baby are greater than the trauma and the pain of the rape or the incest. So the murder of the innocent baby as a result of rape or incest doesn't solve anything it actually complicates and adds to the emotional trauma to that young woman or to that woman. As is often said, two wrongs never make a right. Now, pause for a moment, as painful as this may be, as awkward as this particular issue may be, pause for a moment and think rationally and ask yourself, the innocent child that is conceived either through a rape or through incest is still made in the image of God as much as the baby in the womb that was conceived through the sanctity of holy marriage. Digest that just for a moment. Let me state it again. The innocent baby in the womb of a woman conceived by rape or by incest, that innocent baby is fashioned in the image of God as much as the baby in the womb of a mother, that baby conceived through the sanctity of holy marriage. I wrote something down and I want to read it to you word for word and I'll go over it a couple of times. If necessary, hit pause as you're listening. But I want this statement to be in your notes. Are you ready? Here it is. The circumstances of conception do not lessen the sanctity of life in 
the mother's womb. Let me say it again, word for word. The circumstances of conception do not lessen the sanctity of life in the mother's womb. Now, each situation is different, but the mother does have positive options. Uh, a mother may choose to raise that baby herself in spite of the circumstance and decide it's my baby and it's innocent and that innocent child in my womb, I'm going to love that baby. I'm going to give birth to that baby. I'm going to give identity and family to that baby. I'm going to give support to that baby. That's not everybody's choice. Some choose to give that baby up to adoption. And trust me, there are untold numbers of couples who are praying and dreaming and waiting for an opportunity to adopt a precious baby who do not care the circumstances of conception. Every baby can be a wanted baby and a love baby. Abortion will never erase the pain. I'm being as clear as I possibly can. Abortion will never erase the pain of rape or incest, but it very well may add to it. Question number four, can you be a Christian and be pro-choice? And I've heard Christians, and you have as well, on news and on the media and on the shows with the talking heads, I've heard Christian leaders say, we must remember that it's a woman's body and therefore a woman's choice. But though that is repeated as a mantra continuously, it is an outright lie. It is not the woman's body. It is two bodies. It is two hearts. It is two sets of eyes. It is two sets of hands, two sets of feet. It is two sets of DNA. It is not a woman's body. And even though they try to hide behind that emotional statement, it is two bodies. It is two people. It is two sets of DNA. It is, listen, two eternal souls. It is a woman's body who houses a second body and it cannot be erased or softened by the often political mantra of saying a woman's body, a woman's choice, because that is not biblically true, that is not medically true, that is not biologically true, that is not intellectually true, it is a lie and a deception. There are two bodies, two individuals, two sets of DNA, and most importantly, two eternal souls. A recent scientific study published by the National Library of Medicine stated, don't miss this, quote, biologists from 1,058 academic institutions around the world assess survey items on when a human's life begins, and overall, 5,337 out of 5,577 affirmed the fertilization view. 96%, did you hear me? 96% of secular scientists biologists, and those in the medical fields all conclusively agree that life begins at the moment of conception. And so those of you who have heard the other lie and the other deception, that Christians always say that life begins at conception, but medical science does not support that. 
That is a bold-faced lie and untrue. 96% of secular, not spiritual, secular scientists, biologists, and those in the medical field, 96% conclusively agree that life begins at the moment of conception and the truth probably added to that is 4% that disagree are probably on the payroll of a liberal organization that makes sure that they utter another opinion. But they are a small minority and it simply isn't true because the sacred scriptures teach us that life begins in the womb. The sacred scriptures. But now you know that secular scientists, biologists, those in the medical field conclusively have concluded and agree with the Bible on this subject. When it comes to life in the womb, science and the scriptures are in agreement that life begins at the moment of conception and any attempt to abort that life is the murder of an innocent life and is an egregious sin in the eyes of God. It is impossible to adhere to the views of Scripture. Hear me, it is impossible to say you're a Christian and Christians believe the Bible. That's the definition of a Christian, a follower of Christ who listens to, loves, learns, and lives the teachings of the Bible. By that definition of a Christian, it is impossible to claim to be an, a Christian and adhere to the to the views of sacred scripture and at the same time say you're a Christian and adhere to the views of pro-choice. That, my friend, is a lie, a deception, and a contradiction, and you need to give serious thought to that. Number five, and I close with this, will God forgive me if I have had an abortion? What a very powerful and important question to close with. Will God forgive me if I have had an abortion? I began by telling you that I had no desire to speak to you academically uh, as a Bible college president or a seminary president. I wanted to speak to you as a father. I don't think that I could really say that and be sincere if I didn't address this question. Because Bible teaching should never be diagnosis only. Bible teaching should provide substantial diagnosis, but it must always provide remedy. And there is remedy for all sin. For those who are listening to me who have ever had an abortion or are contemplating an abortion, remember that the sin of abortion is an egregious sin in the eyes of God. Don't ever forget that. I have not been soft on that today. I hope that I have not said that with harshness. If you feel so, let me know in the comments. But I think when I'm done today with a clean heart and clean hands, I could say to God, I carefully prepared that subject. I went over it with the integrity of the Bible but I did my best to share it in love, without judgment. Furthermore, Christians must always offer compassion towards all women who find themselves in a frightening pregnancy situation. Did you hear me? If you're a born-again Christian, you should not be condemning people who have gone through this or perhaps are in process. There must be compassion, firm truth, truth in love, but there must be compassion for all women, regardless of age, who are facing a frightening preg pregnancy situation. Let me uh, read another passage of scripture to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians and the 13th chapter. And beginning to read at verse 1 and reading down through verse 3. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I could speak all the languages of earth 
and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. With that said, don't miss this important point. Yes, Christians must always offer compassion to women in the process of a difficult pregnancy, a frightening situation resulting in pregnancy. But the compassion of the believer must not be mistakenly overlapped with the compassion of the world. Now, Tiff, what do you mean by that? The compassion of the Christian, let me define it for you. The compassion of the Christian heart encourages women to understand the scriptural sanctity of life in their womb and should encourage her that she can be and will be a great mother as well as provide some type of systematic support system throughout her process. That would be Christian biblical compassion to a woman dealing with a frightening pregnancy. But that's not the compassion that the world offers, and there's a difference. Because I must also encourage you to understand that the compassion of the world tells women, we understand, it's your body, it's your choice, we love you, we support you. We're not condemning you. You have every right to pursue your dreams, your career, your success, your advancement. That's the carnal, godless encouragement of our world. That should never be confused or overlap with the compassion of a biblical Christian. We never are being compassionate when we agree with a godless world. And so listen to that. Maybe hit rewind and listen to it one, two, three times until you understand that the compassion we offer to women in a difficult, frightening pregnancy situation is not the same as the compassion of a godless world. I must also add, because I rarely, in fact, I'm trying to think if I have ever heard anybody address this when the hotly debated subject of abortion comes up, uh, I felt it must be addressed. And what is it that I feel must be addressed? I must also add that any man who has pressured or encouraged an abortion with a woman or a mistress or someone outside of the sanctity of marriage or within the sanctity of marriage. Any man who has encouraged or pressured a woman to get an abortion or even paid for the, the, the abortion is just as guilty as the woman who had the abortion. His sin is as egregious in the eyes of God as the abortion of the baby. I'll add another to that list. Any doctor who performs abortion is as guilty as the woman who has an abortion. Because many times in the Christian debate tables, the subject is always the woman, her mistake, her pregnancy, her abortion, her sin, her trauma. But I am here to tell you that according to the truth of the Bible. There are many men, some of you listening to me, you're as guilty as any woman who had an abortion in the eyes of God if you have not repented. If you've been a part of encouraging it, if you've been a part of pressuring her, if you've been a part of paying for it, if you're a male doctor 
who completes the final abortion process, you are as guilty as any woman who has ever had an abortion, and unless you address your sin, you will not, according to the scriptures, inherit the kingdom of God. Because many women would never have had an abortion if it were not for the pressure of a man in their life that pushed and pushed and pushed. In any discussion surrounding abortion, I thought of a statement from the Westminster Confession that goes like this, and I read it to you word for word. Quote, as there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. End of quote. Very powerful, very profound. Can I read it to you again? Quote, as there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. As I have said several times in this teaching, abortion is an egregious sin in the eyes of God, but it is not. I repeat, it is not an unpardonable sin. You can be totally forgiven today, and God can and will heal your pain and your trauma and your memories that perhaps haunt you. Because when God forgives us, we are forgiven. When God cleanses us, praise God, we are totally forgiven and clean. I love that scripture in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, come now, let us, settle this, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. Through faith in Christ, all sin, including the sin of abortion, including those who have been a part of it or pressured it or paid for it, you today can be forgiven. Because, you know, the Bible tells us, and again, I don't want to sit in a chair of judgment because all have sinned. That means all. That includes me. When we stand in the presence of a holy God, none of us can raise a hand and say, I don't deserve judgment. The Bible says all have sinned. And so I'm not trying to condemn you today, but I am telling you that if you have sinned, you must repent. And repentance means you'll not return. Repentance means turn your back on sin and turn your heart to Christ. And many of you that are listening to me now, both men and women, if you'd be honest with God, you're not living a holy life. You're not right with God. You are not following the life and the lessons of Christ. But you can come home today. You can be forgiven today. Has anybody ever looked you in the eyes and loved you enough to say, here's how you can make peace with God and then offered to pray with you? I'd like to do that today. You've heard me say it perhaps hundreds of times, depending on how many years you've listened to me teach and preach. But there are three things you need to do to make peace with God. Number one, you have to recognize your sin. Number two, you have to repent of your sin. Jesus said in Luke 13, unless we repent, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And you must receive Salvation as a gift from God, paid for on the cross of Christ with his own blood. God's spotless lamb paid the price for my sin and your sin. Will you pray with me right now as hundreds and thousands of people do? Can I ask you to please let us know? Write us an email. Write it in the comments section below. Tell me your story or your testimony. 
You can message us privately, email us privately if you don't want it to be seen in the comments. But many of you, would you just write it in the comments if you pray and say, Tiff, I prayed that prayer with you today and I was sincere. Wherever you're at, wherever you're listening, will you just pause right now and let's receive forgiveness once and for all. Let's allow the power of God to wash away all your past, all your trauma, all your sin, all your transgression, all your iniquity. And the Bible said, whoever confesses their sin to God always finds mercy. Pray with me right now, out loud, wherever you're at, just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I recognize my sin. I now repent of my sin. And in childlike faith, I receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I vow today I will live for you all the days of my life. And in place of my weaknesses, fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what you've called me to be. Now according to the Bible which cannot lie, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today as I have repented of sin and received Christ, I now belong to you. I am no longer the property of sin. I am today a child of God. And all of my sin and all of my past is made pure in the eyes of God because of your great grace. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.